All right, a little after five o'clock here in Swoop, Virginia, and uh, we are counting down to the start of the Grindstone 100, which is really Grindstone 101.85. Got to keep that in mind, otherwise that extra 1.85 miles is going to really, really suck. So, uh, yeah, this is awesome. So many people here. Uh, cool to be in the mountains, cool to be in the trees. I love Texas, but I definitely don't miss the dry open spaces. This is awesome. So, uh, yeah, here we go. Uh, time to get psyched. Hey, what's up everybody? Father Zach here, and I'm coming to you today with another race recap video. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about the Grindstone 100, my experience running that race. Uh, it took place uh, this past September 17th through 19th in uh, the town of Swoop, Virginia, a small little town in Virginia. Just to kind of let you know beforehand, I don't plan on having a lot of video uh, footage, like actual race footage in this vlog here. Um, I honestly, I brought my GoPro with me for the race, but it was just such a technical and difficult race. I never used it. So uh, if I have anything, it's mostly just gonna be pictures that maybe my uh, parents took during the race or uh, just some, some kind of miscellaneous video footage. But if you're interested in finding out more about what kind of race Grindstone is and, may, and just my experience running the race, then uh, then stick around. And uh, I'm hopefully gonna go into a little bit of depth about what the course was like and just what my experience was like in general. So a couple months ago, uh, I made a race video kind of recapping my first ever 100 mile uh, ultra, which was the Rocky Raccoon right here in Texas where I'm living right now. and. Um, it was an awesome experience. Uh, it went, I guess, about as well as I could have hoped. Uh, finished the race, which is of course what you're always looking for. And um, basically I enjoyed it so much that probably before I had even really recovered from that run, I was already looking for another race to sign up for, which is uh, always a good sign that you're doing something that you really enjoy. So I had actually been looking at running the Grindstone uh, for a couple years. Uh, oddly enough, back when I lived in Washington, D.C., it was what I had looked at possibly doing for my first 100-mile race, which in retrospect would have been the stupidest idea on earth. I'm so happy that that did not work out for me. But um, usually, I, in the past few years, when I had been looking at that race, I could never do it because... Um, I, I, you know, I mentioned in previous videos that I'm a, uh, I'm a Catholic priest. I'm a Franciscan friar. I'm part of a Franciscan uh, community. And um, usually the grindstone takes place in early October, um, which is for Franciscans, the uh, celebration when we celebrate St. Francis of Assisi. And that's kind of, a, that's a really big deal for us. So I knew that Gosh, if we keep doing this, if this race keeps getting scheduled for October, I'm never gonna be able to do it. So this year, I guess because of COVID, it was scheduled actually in September, which turned out to be just fantastic because I was free and uh, I didn't have to worry about any conflicts. So I just figured, gosh, now or never, let's do this thing. Okay, but there was one problem, right? Is that I live in Texas and this race has got 23,000 uh, feet of gain and loss. It's a it's an out and back. So what you do on the way out, you basically do virtually the same thing coming back. Um, Texas, if any of you guys have ever lived in Texas or been in Texas, especially the part of Texas where I live, which is the Dallas Fort, uh, Fort Worth area, there's not a lot of elevation change at all. I mean, it's I can go run 20 miles around where I live and maybe get in two, three hundred feet of gain. So I knew right off the bat this was going to be a huge challenge trying to prepare for a race with such dramatic elevation gain in a place, part of the country, where there's just not many opportunities for that. Oddly enough, uh, there was a handful of Texans who signed up for this thing. I could see that because they post on the website all of the people who are registering. So you can keep up to date with like who's gonna be in this race, which is really cool. Um, and it's funny because when I showed up in Virginia, I ran into some of these Texans and we were going over like, where did you train? Where did you train? Trying to figure out what everyone was doing. And it was funny because we like, we're all basically training in the same areas because there's really one place in Dallas-Fort Worth area that has hills and it's not much, but Everyone goes to the same exact place, and it's just funny because, uh, we, in theory, I guess we should have all run into each other. But um, sometimes you just got to take what you get. You don't always have 
you know, you're not always in the mountains of Colorado or something. Sometimes you're in the plains of Texas and you just got to deal with it because uh, uh, that's kind of, I think, uh, one of the things you learn running ultras is like, it doesn't work the way you want it to work half the time. You got to just be uh, resourceful. So in the time leading up to the grindstone, I just feel like this race developed this kind of mythical status in my mind. You know, it, it just was something that was so immense. Uh, a, a race over a hundred miles in the mountains of Virginia. Uh, and my, my training felt so inadequate in so many ways that whereas before Rocky Raccoon, I felt like I'm ready for this. I've trained, I've put in the work, I've done everything I need. The grindstone, there was just this question mark, which is like, I've done a few thousand feet here and there. I, I, I put in some good work running a, um, uh, uh, a race when I happened to be back in Pennsylvania, where I'm originally from. I was back at home, I ran a race, it was a 50 miler, put in a lot of good gain during that. So I got that work Pretty in. I did some, some hill running back in my hometown when I was That's on right. vacation. So I did That's some right. stuff, but like, this race had such um, this mythical status in my mind because I just felt like it, I, it felt like a David and Goliath type thing. Like this race is so huge and uh, I just don't know if I have what it takes to get through it. Something about the grindstone and I guess it's probably uh, similar for a lot of races is it takes place in what felt like the middle of nowhere. You know, you're driving down, uh, I flew into Dulles Airport in Virginia. I actually stayed with uh, an, an, uh, some of the uh, Franciscan friar uh, priests in my community who are stationed in Northern Virginia right next to the airport. Uh, spent the night before the race there. Uh, my parents came as well. It was great. Kind of just got to chill, go out, have a beer, relax, watch. Uh, watch you know uh, i guess it was thursday night football and just uh take it easy uh but drove down route 81 the next day a couple of hours and you're just in the middle of nowhere and all of a sudden it goes from being like suburban washington dc uh, nor northern virginia area to the mountains and the mountains just kind of appear out of nowhere those the mountains you run in ah uh, i would assume so <laughs> unless you see any other ones Yikes. And you get to this Camp Shenandoah and it's uh, just a beautiful place. My goodness, I mean, been in Texas and I love Texas, but it's not exactly a place that I would describe as physically beautiful. So being in the mountains of Virginia was such a cool treat. And uh, the temperature was all right. You know, it was probably 70s, 80s, a little bit humid, but that was fine. And um, this Boy Scout camp was just a cool place to kind of host the start of a race. They had like a lodge or whatever there that they had like a pre-race meal. That's where you did your pre-race, all kind of the pre-race race stuff. You got your number and your pre-race, uh, your, your race swag and uh, you could get some food. And they did like a weigh-in. I've never seen this at a race before. They did a weigh-in because they wanted to just make sure you were staying healthy throughout the course. Uh, so that was interesting. That was new. So my parents came with me uh, to the race. We drove together, which was great to not have to worry about driving and stuff. And um, when I got to Camp Shenandoah, just about an hour later, um, my pacer, uh, another Franciscan priest, who actually uh, is the one who got me into ultra running to begin with, his name is Father Gregory. He came, he was gonna pace me through about 35 miles, we had, uh, we had hoped, and um, he showed up uh, right before the race started. So it was great to kind of have everybody together. That's the fun thing about these races is it kind of, gosh, you get to enjoy company of good people. There was something just really nerve wracking before this race and I can't quite put my finger on it. Um, it just felt like such an immense task. And I had already broken through the mental barrier of running hundred miles. It still was something that was somewhat intimidating but I knew I'd done it before so I was like, okay, I can do this again, but the elevation and the terrain and the fact that you were gonna be in the woods in the dark for probably two nights was something that I was just like, this is really hard to wrap my mind around. And uh, as much as I was so psyched to be there in the camp and like that all the other runners are there and you know, it, it was just like a festival atmosphere as these races always are. There was still that like knot in my stomach, like, oh my gosh, this is going to be pain beyond anything I've ever experienced. And I mean, I'm, you know, I don't know if you can read it on this sweatshirt. I'm, I had already gotten my like pre-race 
swag and their, you know, this motto on here, the pain is temporary. And, you know, they literally give you a cookie with your uh, kind of your race stuff. And the cookie on it has the elevation profile of the race. And it's like, you know, you're in for some real fun when they've got the elevation profile on a cookie. Like has been happening a lot during COVID, the race started in waves. And you know, it's kind of funny, this I think falls into the category of things that I'd be totally fine if, if they never went back to how they used to be. Because wave starts are really great, especially for a race like Grindstone that starts out in the open in this camp and quickly uh, narrows down to single track. So it's kind of cool to have wave starts because it just eliminates a lot of the congestion you find early in a race. Sure, you don't really know who's ahead of you or behind you, but honestly, who cares? I mean, in a race like this, it's unless you're like an elite, you don't care who's ahead of you or behind you. So it's nice to have the space anyway. In a weird way, by far, the worst part of this race for me was the first hour. And it was for a number of reasons. I, I felt a little bit sick to my stomach. I think I had just uh, not really eaten enough for lunch. So I was trying to eat like trail mix and stuff right before the race started. And and I don't think that that was ideal, I guess. Um, but I think more than that, I was just flooded right from the start of the race with this, you know, uh, people sometimes talk about running ultras kind of like in the same league as like giving birth. Now, obviously I've never experienced that. I'm not trying to belittle that experience at all, believe me. But like the fact of the matter is after you run an ultra, your brain goes into preservation mode and you're just like, I'm going to forget how miserable that was and only remember the good parts of it. So I do it again, you know? And I think I had so put the pain of my first hundred mile race out of my mind that in the first hour of Grindstone, it all flooded back. And all of a sudden I remembered like, wow, the last time I did this was the worst pain I've ever been in. Why am I doing this again? And I was so overwhelmed by that and it became this really heavy feeling that to be honest with you, there were moments in that first hour where I really thought, could I drop out of this? Could we just forget about this now? Uh, before it's too late, before before I get too far into this thing. And thankfully, that dissipated, that feeling went away, but it was so real and heavy for that first hour, I was just like, uh, is this going to be the worst part of this race? And uh, thankfully, thankfully it was. You know, I had studied the elevation profile for this race pretty uh, rigorously beforehand, um, just so I would be not caught off, uh, caught off guard by some of these climbs. In some of the previous races I've run, I, I never look at the elevation chart and I get kind of blindsided sometimes when I think that the race is, is headed towards downhills and all of a sudden you've got this huge climb. So I figured let's look at this uh, elevation chart, make sure I got the, the hills lined up in my mind. And uh, I'll tell you what, all the studying in the world cannot prepare you for what it looks like to encounter like a 2,500 foot vertical climb in the span of like three and a half miles. Um, look, I grew up in the mountains, I've done hills, I've done trail running in the mountains, on cliffs, all this stuff. I did not have any context for what this looked like. You know, I'm not from the West where this is normal. So all of a sudden you are climbing these hills that are just beyond anything you've ever seen. And uh, I just, I thought I had prepared myself and I was so wrong. But you know, there was this part during the first major climb, which is from mile five through about nine. And it's uh, on part of the course called Elliot Knob, which is uh, one of the high points elevation wise in, in the on the course. And you know, you get kind of sucked into the pain of this climb, right? It was when everyone started taking their trekking poles out. You're going up this fire road that is literally like unimaginably steep. You can't even figure out how any vehicle could ever get up this thing. And it just goes and goes and goes and it's just like lasts forever. And at this point, the light was uh, was dying, the daylight was going down. And I just happened to turn around on a whim just to kind of see what it looked like to see that the, the grade of that hill from, you know, looking down at it. And I just happened to look out over the entire, like kind of this vista, you know, and it's like you see out into the Allegheny Mountains and you could see just forever. And these lights in the nearby like villages and towns and whatnot. And it was just so unreal. The view was so cool 
that I actually started telling everybody around me like, hey, look behind us. Because you get so caught up in the pain of the moment that you forget how beautiful it is. And that's something I really tried to keep in mind in this race. You know, when I ran Rocky Raccoon back in uh, February of this year, I just wanted to finish the race. I wanted to accomplish 100 miles, really check that off my list of, of, of challenges. And uh, so I was just kind of wrapped up in this get it done mentality. You know, I, I downloaded audiobooks, I had playlists, I had all this stuff. And I was like, let's just kind of put myself in a zone where this all kind of just I just go numb and hopefully, you know, we can get through this thing. And for Grindstone, I was just like, I don't want to do that. I want to just be present to this moment. I've trained for this. I wanted to do this. I'm spending money to do this. I've traveled halfway across the country to do this. Like, I want to be here and be present and just every bit of pain I'm experiencing, I want to just be like, yeah, like just soak it up and be like, this is this is great. This is exactly what I wanted. Um, and to just, just not let anything pass me by to where the next day or, you know, a couple days after the race, I'm thinking back and being like, man, I don't even remember it. I don't remember it because I was just listening to a podcast. And it's like, nah, I want to remember this and, and have it be something for the rest of my life that I can always call back and look at. You get to this point uh, at the top of the first climb that was really funny because you, you're on this spur trail where you go up and you basically are supposed to hit this uh, fire tower and touch the, the gate to the fire tower, turn around and head back down to where you connect to the, the, the normal course. And uh, I was running with this guy and all of a sudden we get up to this fire tower. It's gotta be like 90 feet tall or something. And I'm looking up and it's dark at this point. I just see headlamps like bouncing up the fire tower. And I was like, wait a second. This was not in the course description. I gotta climb this fire tower. I'm like terrified of heights here. I'm not about to climb a rickety fire tower. And the guy who I was with was just like, dude, I have run this race like six times and we have never got up this fire tower. And I just looked at him and was like, well, are we, let's just not go up it then. And he's like, all right, deal. So we just touched the fence at the bottom and it seemed like after that, no one went up the fire tower. It's one of those things in an ultra, it's like monkey see, monkey do. Like you gotta be always paying attention because it's so easy to just follow the people in front of you right like off the edge of a cliff, you know? Uh, Cause people are always just in their own world doing their own thing. And you know, I almost ran up a 90 foot fire tower for absolutely no reason in the middle of this race. So I'm really happy that I uh, ultimately listened to the guy next to me and we just didn't do that. I gotta say, you know, as much as I wasn't looking forward to running at night so early into the race, it was a cool experience to be in the night, uh, but also not be in that like complete pain cave, horrible, like everything is miserable type mentality. So like there was a time that I was really almost intentionally letting people either like pass me or trying to get ahead of people uh, so I could run by myself. Um, it just in general, I don't, I'm not a pack runner. I love to be on my own in these races. Um, and I just got to the point multiple times at night where there was literally nobody, like nobody in front of me, nobody behind me, couldn't see headlamps in either direction. The only way I knew I was on the course is because it was super well marked. So I was just following the, the little reflective tags that uh, would show up on the trees now and again. But it was just like, this is so worth it. You're just in the middle of the trees, looking up at like the moon, it was like almost a full moon, and you could hear like the crickets and the animals in the woods. And it was just like, yeah, like I'm just by myself running in the middle of the night with my headlamp. Like who, why am I doing this? Like who is doing this right now? Um, other than the other like 300 people with me and like, Praise God, praise God for this opportunity to just do something so unique and so cool with a, with, a, with a group of people, but also have that opportunity to feel so alone uh, and, and it's to, to have such a sense of solitude. You know, one of the other reasons I don't really like pack running is because I don't necessarily run the same way as a lot of people. I noticed during this race, and maybe this is kind of indicative of the larger ultra running scene, People plow through the downhills and really take the uphills super conservatively. I am completely the opposite. I've got long legs, I'm six foot five. The uphills, I just love to just like 
I don't know, just attack them. I've always been a good hill runner back to like my high school and college cross country days. So uh, I love just going at these uphills and people don't tend to do it. Uh, but then on the downhills, people pass me like I'm standing still, which is fine. You know, I don't care. I'll get out of people's way. Like I'm happy to do it. But on the uphills, it's a bit frustrating because sometimes you, you hit a train of people and everybody just kind of assumes that, oh, we all just take the uphills pretty easy. And that's just not the way I run. So it was hard for me to constantly have to, to get around groups of people, especially on single track and like grindstone more than any race I've done is just like so much single track. There are definitely places where you can pass people, but there were miles and miles at a time where it's like, well, I'm just in this train and there's like 20 people here and I'm just gonna have to suck it up and, and realize like maybe this is good for me in the long run that I uh, will have to take it a little bit easy here, maybe save my legs for, for some climbs on the lighter uh, half of the course. But you know, like the downhills, obviously we're getting to people too. That's what I was cracking up. At about mile 30, I remember passing this dude and uh, we were talking for a few minutes and I just like laughed and I was like, man, have you ever had your legs hurt this bad 30 miles into a race? Like my legs are screaming and we're not even a third of the way into this thing. And this guy was just like, uh, he was, I mean, he was really struggling. And I said to him, I was like, man, 10, 15 miles ago, people were passing me like I was standing still on these downhills and there ain't nobody passing me now. And it's not because I'm moving fast. It's because everyone is hurting and we are 30 miles into this thing. I came in a mile 35 on such a high. It was probably honestly one of the few highs I had during the whole race, which is kind of a bummer, but sometimes that's just the way it is. But it, it just happened to be a really runnable part of the course. And there was this big aid station at mile 35, 36, something like that, which was right at the base of what was the biggest climb on the course, which is, uh, I think, about a little over 3,000 vertical feet over the span of maybe six or seven miles. And um, this aid station was like a big party. And uh, I just remember at that point, for whatever reason, just feeling like this race is flying by. Like, I don't feel like I've been moving for that long. I think the night has something to do with that. It kind of puts time completely out of perspective. But um, I just felt like, all right, we're, we're almost halfway done with this thing. And uh, and this is, it's really rough, but uh, it's doable. I think I can actually finish this race. So all that combined, and I got to see my parents who are my, my uh, crew, um, got to see them at that aid station. And uh, and they were shocked that like, they didn't expect to see me. I took, completely caught them off guard. So I think all those things combined just made me, uh, just put me in a really good place at that point in the race, ready to kind of attack that that big hill. So that's a big climb of the race. You go from mile uh, 35 or so up to maybe like 42, which is where you hit that next aid station, which is called Little Bald Knob, uh, which is at the top of, I think, basically the highest point on the course. And um, it's, a, it's a tough climb, but it's not awful. Compared to some of the other climbs, it was actually fairly mild. It kept going forever, but there was never really a part of it that was like super miserable. It was good footing for the most part. Um, and it was kind of cool because the woods were a little less dense there and you could really see, uh, turn around and just see headlamps everywhere. You know, and at the top of that hill is when you started to finally see the leaders coming back at you, which is always like, honestly a time in the race that you kind of look forward to because you know like all right if there are people on their way back that means that sooner or later i'll be on my way back too it's going to be a heck of a lot longer than it takes the leaders but uh at least i know that there is an end to this thing and it's kind of coming into vision and you know as i got to the top of of uh that climb up to this little bald knob aid station i kept i was talking to some people around me and we were talking about the sunrise which was coming up basically any minute and we were so excited because the sun was going to come up basically at the top of the mountain, which is like, could you imagine better timing? Like you reach the highest point on the course, huge climb, and the sun is rising. And uh, it's funny because I remember the sunrise being one of the most rejuvenating parts of my first hundred mile. Or like when the sun came up, you just felt like, okay, like that was miserable, but I'm alive again. And nothing could have been further from the truth in Grindstone. Like. The sun came up and I was just like waiting for that spark and it just didn't come because I was just feeling like garbage. Like 
my feet were starting to really hurt. And I thought like, I must have blisters like crazy. So I took my shoes off at that mile 42 aid station. And uh, my feet were honestly looking okay. Some like hot spots here and there. So I put on some Vaseline. They had Vaseline at like every aid station, which was such a gift. Oh my gosh, what geniuses put that at every aid station. I'd love to shake their heads because uh, that was incredible. But uh, honestly though, I was just not feeling it at that point. And there was this big like fire pit where people were just chilling, hanging around the fire at that aid station. And gosh, like you just felt like, Are you guys kidding me? Like it would be so easy to just call it right now and just sit at this fire pit and just be like, I'm gonna chill here, have a cup of coffee, eat some breakfast. And like, yeah, uh, that's a good day. And, uh, but you had to just put that out of mind and be like, no, nope, the suffering uh, must go on. So pushed out of that aid station, despite probably my <laughs> better judgment. So there was another spur trail right around mile 50. There's two of them in the course. You only do them outbound. You skip them uh, on your way back to the finish. And uh, the second one was really short. It might've been maybe a half mile, if that, uh, but it hit this, uh, kind of viewpoint where it was actually accessible to cars and stuff which was a little bit of a bummer you always like when you can only ac access something through like i don't know working for it but you know such as america sometimes um but you know here's the thing it's like for 50 miles you're running through like what i've heard other runners describe as like a green tunnel it's just like trees and darkness and nothing and all of a sudden you get to you get to something that just made it all worth it, which was this view of like being 4,000 feet up in the air in the Allegheny Mountains looking over all of, of Virginia. And um, those are the moments where you're like, I'm really happy I signed up for this. All right, so 50 something miles into this thing, uh, turnaround point. And uh, yeah, I'd say this is all worth it. Look at that, oh my gosh, unreal, unreal. Wow. At mile 52, I think it is, is what they call the turnaround point, uh, Briary Branch or something like that. And uh, that's where I picked up my pacer, Father Gregory. He had totally uh, overshot or like, he, he, he just was completely uh, over anticipating me showing up at that aid station. He was there like, three hours early uh but he did get to see the sunrise from up in the mountains which i guess that's a win um but anyway i showed up there and that was kind of like a little bit of a rough aid station a lot of people were dropping out and uh they had a lot of like medical personnel there was a guy on a walkie-talkie a race official who's like reporting other people who are dropping out and it's just kind of like negativity that you don't necessarily want so I kind of had to spend a, lot, a while at that aid station. It was probably the only aid station I spent a good deal of time at. I was, generally speaking, really mindful of getting in and out of aid stations. The way I run, I look forward to trying to pick up time where I can. And if I can do it at aid stations, I'll do it because I get such bad GI issues during races that sometimes I get sidelined either with bathroom or you know throwing up uh constantly so you got to make up the time when you can and aid station is a good place to do it but i got out of that aid station after i kind of just changed socks uh loaded up my vest with some you know energy gels and whatnot and, and just hit the road again and this part was on like pavement which was the only part of the course that's on some pavement it's like uh maybe five miles total uh which was a little rough on the feet also Almost everyone's using trekking poles, and that's kind of weird to have to do that on pavement. But, you know, whatever, you got through it. And um, it's a nice wide open part of the course. You can see people well. You can kind of group up with other runners and talk to people about how things are going so far. So I did appreciate that aspect of it. It was like one of the few times of the race where things felt a little bit social, um, which is usually not something I'm a fan of. But honestly, when, after you've gone like 14 hours without talking to people, it's good. So I was kind of ahead of what I had deemed as a goal pace when I got to the turnaround. So that gave me a lot of confidence. You know, I started doing the math in my head, like what is the um, cutoff of this race, 38 hours, which in my mind felt fairly generous. You know, even in retrospect, I think that's a, a totally reasonable cutoff for a race like this. Um, but I was just doing math, like thinking if I just run 
20 minute miles from here on out, I'll make it, I'll make it fairly comfortably. So that was a huge, you know, I, I'm not really like big into banking time, but it's cool to hit the, the turnaround and be like, I, I can make this, I can do this. I just have to run a reasonable clip the rest of the way. It was probably around mile, I'm gonna say like 60 or so that I really started to feel the stomach issues. Uh, like I said, this is something so common for me that it's not a matter of, of if, but when. So the fact that it took me like 60 miles to be in real rough shape was honestly not a big deal. I, I felt pretty fortunate. Um, but it, it did start to get to the point where you know, it's funny, on in a race like this, you kind of linger around a lot of the same runners for a while, like sometimes 20, 30, 40 miles. And uh, I started to almost develop like a reputation of the uh, around the people around me as the guy who's just constantly puking his guts out the whole race. Um, which is funny because people get freaked out by it, but I do it all the time that it's just like, I will literally just throw up while I'm running. Um, and sometimes it's just like out with the old and with the new, you know, get, get all that garbage out and uh, just make sure you keep replenishing stuff. That's all. It's, it's, a, it's a nutrition game. It's an eating contest, you know, uh, get the food down, keep it down. And if you got to slow down in order to keep the food down, then so be it. You know, you're, you, you ain't getting anywhere uh, without, without <laughs> calories. So if you're not keeping them down, you got to You got to take it easy. Uh, th th there's no point in being heroic and just, crushing out miles without any hydration or nutrition. You know, you'll just end up in a ditch somewhere. When I got back into what was the North River Gap aid station, which is at the bottom of that major climb, um, it was devastating. I cannot describe this aid station, but I will remember it forever, I think, in my mind, as one of the most just disgusting 20 minute periods I've ever lived through. And uh, independently of each other, both myself and my mom referred to this aid station as a field hospital. And that is exactly what it felt like. It felt like, and I don't wanna like, you know, belittle this, but it, it felt in some sense like a battlefield. Like people were like shivering and shaking and bleeding and walking around like aimlessly and delirious. And it was just like, and I sat down in a chair to change my shoes because it was a crew. It was a crew ex, uh, accessible station, so my parents were there. And uh, it was funny because just like a couple hours before that, I hit that same aid station. It was like a big party, and I was at my absolute highest point. And then I hit it again at the bottom of that hill, and it was just like complete uh, mayhem, like complete carnage. And I just remember thinking, I need to leave this place. Like I need to get out of this aid station because this is a place of death. Like this is a place where people are dropping out of this race and I do not want to be here. Um, so I just got moving and as I was like standing up, I remember my dad telling me, you just got 35 miles left. And I cannot even like explain to you what that felt like to hear that. Uh, and let me just say it wasn't good. It was not good. You know, I 35 miles in the grand scheme of a hundred mile race is, is not much, but like, 35 miles left for how bad I felt, I actually was choking back tears. And uh, that was, that's that's a bad place, you know, when you're in the pain cave that deep. So um, just to get out of that aid station was a huge victory. Like once I got out of there and I was like, I'm moving, I'm alive. I can keep getting, you know, taking my uh, energy gels keep on drinking like Tailwind and, and Gatorade. I was going like old school with Gatorade in this race and it was working for me. So it's like, if I can just keep on moving, I can make it. Uh, it's gonna suck, but I can make it. So then it was like a death march for the next five miles, honestly. It was a part of the course that was relatively like rolling hills. So you could afford to, I don't know, really regulate your pace a little bit. So I intentionally just went into like almost shut down mode, like hibernation. I just started walking at like 25 minute mile pace, just eating so much, drinking so much, just trying to figure out if I could 
maybe get enough energy source, like energy supply in me. Maybe my body will spring back to life. And it totally worked. It totally worked. I don't know why I doubted it would. Like, because enough people I know have told me like, hey, if you ever get in trouble, just chill, sit down, eat something, you'll bounce back. And uh, I kind of was like, I don't know, like, is that actually going to play out that way? And it did. It did. Um, I never like, it's not like I was like, back and feeling better than ever, but I was back, you know? And um, I was able to, to kind of see a path forward at that point, see how I could finish this race. Because all of a sudden I didn't feel like I was just the walking dead anymore. It felt like I've got some life in me and I, I, I think I might be able to do this. And you know, something I realized during this race, right, is that dropping out of an ultra is something I'm always afraid of before I run the race. Like, am I going to have to DNF? Like. It's a scary thought. No one wants a DNF. Nobody wants to, to feel like they failed something they put so much time and effort into, right? I mean, that's just a miserable way to to put a bow on something. You, you don't want to, you want to end with a victory, you know? So uh, you kind of always keep, that's always in the back of your mind. Like, what if I don't finish? But the reality is this, it's like in a race like this, you don't just stop and lay down in the middle of the, of the trail unless you're like dying, right? So it becomes a matter of like, can I get to the next aid station? That's it. It's a battle of like five miles at a time. Can I make it to the next aid station? And at that point, can I make that choice to not drop out when I get to that aid station? And in that sense, it's never like this weird like DNF like looming over your head like a cloud. It just becomes this very manageable series of choices. Can I press on when I get to this next point? And if the answer is yes, I can finish. Going into the second night was honestly just so trippy. Like, I don't know. I I knew it was a possibility. I knew it was actually I knew it was an inevitability. Um, but I guess you just don't think about it until it until it comes. Um, but uh, I don't know. It, it's just the nights are difficult, and you already got through one, and to go into the second one on like sleep deprivation. Uh, is is a little bit discouraging, but at the same time, you knew like it was an indication that we're getting close to finishing this thing up. One of the weird things I noticed too, especially as the second night began, and I began to kind of retrace the parts of the course that we had done in the first 15 to 20 miles. Um, that was a weird experience because you realize that you're mind is not a really accurate keeper of data. Um, and what I mean by that is on the way out when you're feeling good, some of these really, really gnarly sections of trail just feel like whatever, you know, uh, you knew it was going to be hard and it's hard. Um, but when you're coming back, I'm remembering like, oh yeah, at this point there should be a pretty decent uphill. But never in my life did I expect that it was a hill that was going to last an hour to get up. I don't know why I just didn't remember that. Um, and it just goes to show that like your brain only remembers certain things and sometimes it chooses to forget things that were really tough, um, which is not exactly helpful when you're trying to retrace your steps going back and feeling infinitely worse than you did like 20 something hours earlier. I picked up my dad as a pacer um, at around mile, let's say 88 or something like that. I think there's like 15 miles left or 14 miles. And um, that was, you know, that's always, uh, he helped pace me for my last uh, 11 miles of Rocky Raccoon. And uh, it was great. It, you know, I love having him to talk to and just spend that time with very encouraging. Um, but it was also a point in the race where I was just really fading. Um, I didn't anticipate that the sleep deprivation aspect would get to me, um, but it, it really did in those last few hours. And it wasn't so much like I felt like sleepy, like I want to take a nap. It was just this sense of being like completely in la la land. Like I just could not focus on reality and like what was going on. And I never had this before, but I began to just hallucinate. And I, it was something I anticipated might happen, but I had never experienced it, so I didn't really know how it would be. You know, it was kind of scary. I would think I was seeing bears everywhere, uh, which I, I don't know why. 
And I kept thinking that people had left things all over the course. I was seeing like duffel bags and, and all sorts of like equipment left all over the course of, and it wasn't there, none of it was there. And even like as we approached uh, going to the top of Elliot Knob for the, 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 the second time, uh, it, I kept feeling like we were on top of this mountain and I thought like we were out in the open and there was like the sky, nothing but the sky around us and, and, and like the wind blowing, you know, like what you would experience on top of a mountain. Uh, but then I'd look up and realize we're just in a tunnel of trees. Like my brain had just substituted reality with its own reality, uh, which is kind of scary because you're on like the edge of a cliff at parts. So I told my dad, honestly, I was like, dad, pay attention. Because if I start walking off the edge of a cliff, like you gotta grab me, which is uh, not something I ever thought I'd have to say to my dad. Uh, but you know, things get weird in these races, so you kind of get put in positions you're not exactly anticipating. I had watched uh, after actually after I finished the race, I went back, and I don't know why I didn't do this beforehand; it would have been smart. But I actually watched the uh, grindstone kind of in-depth recap that uh, Ryan Clayton had done on his channel after he finished the race in 2017. And it's funny because I did not watch this beforehand, but how much my experience mirrored his experience, especially in those final miles. There's this aid station, which is the first aid station on the course. It's also obviously the last aid station on the course. And it's at, I think mile would be like 95, 96. And for whatever reason, in between mile 88 and 96, let's say, um, I just totally misjudged how long it was going to take to the point where I was like, are we even on the course anymore? And I was starting to really like question, I don't know, like my own sanity. Like what is happening here? We've been walking, hiking for four hours and I'm not even at this aid station that's eight and a half miles away. That's not possible. And you just start to get frustrated. And I remember there were times I just wanted to scream, like literally just scream into this wilderness uh, because you just felt so deceived by your own mind in a weird way. Uh, and it was just some frustrating and kind of helpless feeling. But after we finally did hit that last aid station, it kind of just was like, all right, um, this is it. And I can remember thinking in that moment, uh, probably at about mile 98 or so. I told my dad, I'm, right now I'm taking a mental snapshot of how awful I feel, how much my feet hurt, because they hurt more than I could ever imagine. Every, every step on these jagged rocks felt like agony. Um, my legs were so cramped up and tight. And just like every bit, my, my gosh, like just swinging trekking poles for a hundred miles. I felt awful, all, you know, in, in summary. And I just took this mental snapshot just to be like, I want to remember what this feels like. Because every time I run a race like this, I forget. I get back to the finish line and days pass and I don't remember what that was like to feel that bad. And um, so I just wanted that snapshot and I, I did my best and I think it helped, but ultimately, right, there's like no substitute for what that feels like, you know, other than, than like real pain that people experience in their lives, you know, illness and cancer and all sorts of mental disease. And, you know, part of the reason I, I, I feel like so drawn to ultra running, especially as a priest, is because so much of my ministry in my life involves just entering into people's suffering. And I, I feel so inadequate and most of the time to handle that, to be with people on a, you know, emotional level when you can't, you can't, I mean, you, you can't perceive what people are going through half the time. And being able to run an ultra like this, a hundred mile race in the mountains, sometimes it feels like as close as you can get to put, trying to put yourself in a position where you can feel some of the pain, just even a brief, tiny snapshot, the smallest fraction of the pain that some people feel in their daily lives. Uh, and in a weird way, I just try to appreciate that because um, ultimately, like, who am I to enter, to try to enter into the lives of people who I, I could never fathom of their suffering? Uh, so running an ultra like this just, it helps, it helps a little bit. 
And uh, it's not perfect, obviously, it's not even close to sufficient, but it's something. I actually ran the last, uh, let's say like half mile of this race. I don't know how, it just kind of came out of nowhere. I probably power hiked most of the last 20 miles, but the last half mile, when you see the finish line, it's just like, all right, all on the line, let's go. Um, and I was able to run, and it's funny because uh, I felt like I was moving really quick. Uh, and when I watched the video back, uh, it's, it's, it's disgustingly slow, but that's all right. It's cool to be able to at least finish running. You know, you want to finish a, a race, like moving in a running motion. That's always fun. Go, um, but I finished like at the time I wanted to finish. I, I had guessed that it would take me about 33 hours to run the race. It would be 34 hours and 20 minutes. Um, so I was really pleased with that. Um, really pleased with my time. Um, I don't, there's obviously places I could have improved. There always is. Um, but ultimately super, super thrilled with, with that performance. And you know, when I finished the race, of course you go through the finish line, you get your buckle, which is always like something that I probably look forward to way more than most people do. I think there's something so cool about like collecting these buckles. Um, but anyway, I finished the race and I, I sat down in a lawn chair that I, that, uh, my, my mom had set up uh, to be ready for me. And of course, I, you know, my pacer, Father Gregory, is there waiting for me. And it's just a cool thing. Get to watch some other people finish the race. And there was like this, uh, uh, the Boy Scouts who run the, who, you know, utilize the camp were running like a uh, concession stand inside of their lodge there. So everyone, my parents and Father Gregory went in to, to get some food. And I was just sitting there by myself in this chair, just like unable to move, feeling miserable. And, um... I can remember just like looking up at the finish line banner where the grindstone logo is just like on this banner and I just started tearing up. Um, I, it was just this moment of like unbelievable thanks. I, I was just so thankful. This race was such a beast in my mind and to be able to do it. Um, against kind of, in my opinion, like all odds, like coming from Texas, I, I didn't feel even remotely adequate to do this. And uh, to make it through the race was just like, heck yeah. Like I, I, I just, I couldn't believe it. That's really all I could say. I couldn't believe it. I was, I was so thankful, so thankful to make it. And then went back to Texas like uh, the next day after I just struggled through some of the worst sleep of my life. My feet were swollen like a uh, big red balloon. It was pathetic and disgusting. And uh, I made my way through the airport. I think that was the real, the real ultra marathon took place in Dulles Airport, me trying to get to my gate. Um, but you know, uh, it's all worth it, right? How much more would that hurt if you've got to go through that after a DNF, right? So as much as it's painful, at least you can say you, you made it and uh, it makes it all worth it, honestly. And you know, but here's the thing, right? Even if I didn't make it, which was a real possibility in this race and I was aware of that, it would have still been worth it. Uh, why? You know, people ask me a lot when I get back, you know, especially I'm at this church here in Texas, uh, there's 4,000 families at this church. A lot of people know I'm doing these races. Um, and they'll ask me, you know, why are you doing this? Uh, gosh, what a good question, right? I asked myself that. And, you know, I, there's a lot of reasons, right? But I think ultimately, ultimately it's like, our lives are easy. You know, I remember, I remember uh, watching um, Free Solo, the movie about Alex Honnold climbing El Cap. And, uh, he, he talks in that movie about like, why do we all desire such cushy lives? You know, nothing great has ever been accomplished by living a cushy, comfortable life. And that resonated so much with me. It, it, you just come to the term, to come to terms with the fact it's like human beings need to suffer. We need to have some connection to pain. It's I think kind of this place where we were, we're most at home in a weird way. And because our lives can become so easy. We become so complacent with just the status quo. And because of that, we're never prepared to, to handle so much of the hardships that are inevitable to the human condition, right? So when you choose to do a race like this, it's just some way of like saying no to the kind of cushiness of the world. And don't get me wrong, like life is still easy in a lot of ways. Like I live in 
the United States. I get to go to bed in a in a bed every night, you know. Um, I, I eat good meals and I'm surrounded by great people. Life is good. But for those 34 hours you run around the mountains of Virginia, life is <laughs> really miserable. And uh, it's beautiful in that misery. So I love that. I love that part of ultra running. And that's kind of my why. If there's a why, that's it. And also, I just feel the need to prove to myself that I can do it. Um, that when the, when the road gets tough, uh, as it will for all of us, that I've been there. That I've been there and I've, I've pushed through. And that's it. That's that's the sport for me. I have no desire to ever be an elite. I don't care to be someone who has, you know, who, who anybody is ever looking at my name on a sign up list and, and fearing my presence. I'll tell you that right now. Uh, I just want to be someone who can do these races and, and feel like I've, uh, I don't know, feel like I've, I've conquered something and become better for it. So anyway, that's Grindstone 100, uh, also known as Grindstone 101.85, uh, false advertisement there from the crew. But hey, uh, shout out to Clark, the uh, the uh, race director for Grindstone. Heck of a race that guy puts on. EcoX is the name of the kind of, I guess, uh, company that sponsors a lot of those really difficult races there in Virginia. Um, super super well-run event excellent aid station volunteers really helpful really knowledgeable course was well marked everything was perfect i cannot literally point out one complaint oh i there's one thing that i will say if you're ever running this race and i absolutely recommend it especially as one of the i think one of the more difficult races probably on the east coast if you're kind of a native east coast guy like myself uh might be something you want to check out but keep in mind, there are no porta potties on the grindstone. I was have been spoiled by these more uh, kind of uh, beginner friendly ultras, and uh, let's just put it this way: there was a lot of paper towels being grabbed by me at aid stations because I had no idea that uh, there were no porta potties. So remember that if you ever do the grindstone. But that is my only negative, and it's not really even a negative. It's just me being stupid enough to not uh, check that out beforehand. So anyway, on to the next race. Uh, like a true masochist, uh, within a couple days of finishing this thing, I already signed up to run Cruel Jewel 100 next year in Georgia uh, on May 13th. So let the fun begin again, right? Uh, at least I don't have to train in the summer this time. So anyway, that's kind of my race vlog, race recap for Grindstone. Um, Sorry, it's not super interesting or professionally shot or whatever. Um, but I'm hoping that if this is a race you want to do, you found something worthwhile here. Um, it's a tough race, but it's an awesome race. I totally give it uh, my two thumbs up for whatever that's worth. All right. Thanks, everybody. God bless.